Good times. Okay, so uh, welcome everyone. Thank you for uh, coming on this wonderful uh, day. This is probably one of the nicest days in Oregon to be outside, and here we are. Uh, I hope it will be worthwhile for you. Um, as I was saying to somebody, this is, uh, um, you, you've heard about string theory and, uh, you know, inflation and all that sort of stuff. Like this is the, my friend Jim Baggett calls that fantasy, fairy tale physics is his word. So this is where the real action is. Uh, not that I have it all worked out, but you'll see. Anyway, so uh, this is the uh, um, 2015, 2016 Linus Pauli Memorial Lectures. Uh, my name is Terry Bristol. And uh, this is, I'm the president of the Institute for Science, Engineering, and Public Policy. There we go. Which is, uh, uh, puts this on, but it only does that with the help of our co-sponsors. I want to mention them. Mentor Graphics Corporation. Yes, thank you. They, uh, and uh, next year hangs in the balance of their decisions. Uh, Oregon Episcopal School, FEI Company, Rockwell Collins, Portland State University, Onami, Portland Community College, Clark College, uh, Clackamas Community College, Albina Community Bank, and of course Metro Graphics Foundation, which helps us do tickets for the for the students. Uh, check your cell phones. I'm going to just jump right in because there's this possibility that I might run a little long. Not really, but uh, I've been known. Uh, okay, so um, yeah, I think I'm okay. Um, all right, so. Uh, so, rethinking the second law of thermodynamics, heat work, nature of time in a meaningful universe. I had to throw the last two in. This really isn't about time, but it does have implications, so you kind of see that. And it also, uh, I, I just, it bugs me how these guys come out, these physicists come out, it's like, oh, and now that we understand the universe, we are sure that it's, one thing we're sure of that is meaningless. I'm going like, yeah, right. You, you, you really uh, asked that question in a substantial way. Uh, not really. So uh, I'm going to throw that in. Okay, so who am I in a way? Uh, president of that, I taught for seven, eight years at Linfield, on and off for like 20 years at Portland State. And I started out in philosophy of science, and then I it morphed because I was not happy with the scientific well, with the, our view of science, number one, and number two, with the scientific view of the universe seemed to me a bit, a bit wonky. And uh, and so that's evolved into this, what I've come to call philosophy of engineering, uh, which you'll see. I have at Berkeley undergraduate, London. Or, and these are my mentors, basically. Uh, Sir Carl was the uh, head of, you know, the honcho honcho. Carl, uh, Thomas Kuhn was the person who pulled the kind of field together. Fire Robin was my honors thesis advisor. Lakatos was my PhD advisor. And uh, anyway, they're all rebels. They're <laughs> all rebels. And so I am a rebel too. So <laughs> this is before I love this uh, first rule of thermodynamics. This is what I'm talking about thermodynamics. And you'll see why. So what you know like uh, if if you ask people who have gone through physics or you know any any of the te technical fields at all engineering uh what was the worst course you ever took in the whole field and it almost always they'll say it was thermodynamics and the reason not i mean it is hard it's hard because it kind of like you know there's a lot of technical stuff in it but it's hard also because it doesn't make sense <laughs> so here's another little thing so <laughs> this is a deal where where uh Lisa had invented a uh, perpetual motion machine, and uh, I was, uh, anyway. Okay, so uh, what, what is uh, thermodynamics? And I'm going to say it very simply, uh, I'm going to say it's a, it's a theory of, of change. And that means like anything, I mean, motion, uh, things, any change at all is like, how does it happen? How do things move around? Anything that's change. I mean, it's like, it's not stuck. How do things change and how and why? So a more formal thing has to do with the branch of physics that deals with uh, conversions from one to another, f various forms of energy and allows these effects, these affect uh, temperature, pressure, volume. We'll get more into that, but that's a technical thing. So this is one of my favorite uh, qu quotes about thermodynamics. Uh, this is from Arthur Eddington, who was one of the big deals uh, in uh, in physics turn of the century. He supposedly went and confirmed uh, uh, Einstein's general theory of relativity initially. So he says, <laughs> he says, if someone points out to you 
uh, you don't have to read it, I could all read it to you, that your pet theory of the universe is in disagreement with uh, Maxwell's equations, then so much for the worse for Maxwell's equations. If it is found that, uh, that uh, to be contradicted by observation, well, those experimentalists, they do bungle things sometimes. But if your theory is found to be against the second law of thermodynamics, I can't give you any hope. I can give you no hope. There's nothing uh, for it but to collapse in deepest humiliation. Okay, so this is a pretty strong thing. <laughs> so now part of the problem, the point I'm going to point out to you is, so I'm going to put it this way. So one of the things that, what Eddington's saying here, really the way I'm going to interpret him, is he's saying like, your phys you got your physics, you got this version of physics, you got that version of physics. Thermodynamics rules more than that, above that, okay? It's more fundamental or whatever. So I'm going to agree with that to some extent. So it's going to say that if your physics doesn't fit with thermodynamics, then you need to rethink your physics. And that's kind of one of my themes for tonight, okay? Because I'm going to argue to you that it doesn't, that the current stuff doesn't. Okay, so... Uh, is that what I wanted to do? Yeah. Beep, beep. Okay, that was out of sight. So, uh, in modern science is mechanics, uh, and mechan what I mean by, what I'll mean by, by mechanics generally is uh, what started out, what I'll call, call, call it classical mechanics, which was, you know, Copernicus, Kepler, Galileo, Descartes, Huygens, Newton into Maxwell. Maxwell's kind of like on a, a, a bit on the edge there because it pushes us in towards uh, quantum theory. And explanation is based you know, what we meant by an explanation in science was, in fact, a mechanical explanation, okay, uh, by some law. And, the, and the, the premier version are Newton's laws. Uh, you know, the first law, you know, uh, nothing moves or changes unless you hit it with something, okay? Either, either it's motionless, it has to be hit with something, or it's in uniform motion and it doesn't change unless you hit it with something. Okay, that's first law. And that's what we were that second law I'm not going to worry about tonight. Third law is important. It's every action has an equal opposite reaction. Net change, zero. Okay, that will be important. Uh, so in general, what I'm going to be saying here is that mechanics, in that sense, doesn't really go anywhere. Uh, because of this symmetry thing, action, reaction, symmetry, it doesn't really, it's not helping us a lot with change. Okay, because everything just like, adds up to zero, as we'll see. And the conservation laws, which are very fundamental to classical mechanics, they're really not, I mean, you think like, oh, we discovered conservation. We didn't discover conservation. Conservation is a consequence of this symmetry of action-reaction symmetry. So it has, you have to have conservation of energy, conservation of matter, conservation of conservation of everything. Okay, so that comes from what everybody didn't talk about for a long time, but in the modern last century, they've talked about a lot, and that is there's this fundamental defining symmetry principle of mechanics, okay? And uh, classical, classical thermodynamics uh, phenomena are all about change, and they're about cumulative historical evolutionary change. So, uh, going back, and I was mentioning to somebody that in researching this over the last six months, there's this thing here about being and becoming. It's like things that are static and things that are changing. And that's, that goes back. So what we're dealing with here in a way is not really hugely new. Uh, it goes back. So and I, I, from something I'll tell you about later, Heisenberg got me onto something. He has a little book called Physics and Philosophy. And the question is, is the universe same? You know, what is the, what Ar and this goes to Aristotle's metaphysics, Heisenberg refers to this. And the issue is, you know, what, it, what, is the, what is it that makes things change? It has to be something that had the potential to make them change, and that's kind of being, and, then it, and anyway, it goes back and forth and back and forth. And I would say, if you read Aristotle's metaphysics, he beats the issue to death. He, tried, he has seven books of the metaphysics. They're all after, the, all going after the same issue. And the same issue is, what is the, fundamental stuff? What is the fundamental being of the universe? Is it, is it something that's static? Well, then how does it change? But if it's something that changes, but then how is it the same? Or Anyway, so, um, so the, uh, one of the stimuluses that got me into this and started shifting me is, is this book by uh, this guy Peter Atkins at Oxford, and he's written a bunch on thermodynamics and one of the textbooks, and he's a chemist, really, chemical thermodynamics. 
Uh, and so this is one of the quotes that I found in his book that got me going. He says, the aims adopted and the attitudes struck by Carnot and Boltzmann, these are the two programs that I'm going to talk about tonight, two approaches to thermodynamics, epitomized thermodynamics. Carnot traveled towards thermodynamics from the direction of the engine, then the symbol of industrial society. His aim was to improve its efficiency. More or less true. Boltzmann traveled to thermodynamics from the, uh, the atom, the symbol of emerging scientific fundamentalism. His aim was to increase our comprehension of the world at the deepest levels then conceived. And Boltzmann had a bad time because not everybody has believed that atom, they thought atom, the whole idea of atoms was sort of symbolic, they weren't real things. So they, uh, he killed himself in the end. Uh, but maybe for that, maybe for other reasons. Anyway, so two aims, that's great. And then he says this. Thermodynamics still has both aspects and reflects complementary aims, attitudes, and applications. Now, the trick here is I go like, wait a minute, wait a minute. That isn't what I was taught. <laughs> but, that depends on this, here's the trick. Whether or not you were taught by physicists or engineers. Okay, and I'll come back to this later. But if you're taught by physicists, you probably bought into the same thing I bought into, and that was that, well, Carnot was kind of an afterthought. It's something about caloric and blah, and really Boltzmann was the Boltzmann's the fundamental thing. And so much most of thermodynamics is taught takes Boltzmann's approach to be the the correct one. And Carnot's maybe it's a subdivision or you know a special case or something like that. Okay, so what am I what am I approach tonight is what's the relationship between these two? It's tonight's agenda. So it's Carnot versus Boltzmann. How do these two very successful approaches, and if you're into Boltzmann and the statistical thermodynamics, I mean, this is hugely successful. Uh, you can do lots of stuff with it, um, and uh, it's really cool stuff. Yeah, but what is the relationship then between that and the stuff that Carnot is talking about? So the basic idea is usually either one of these has to be a special case, limited thing within the more general other one. So. One of them is, you know, okay, so either Carnot eats Boltzmann or Bol Boltzmann eats Carnot. It's the kind of like confrontation. And, and the, so the challenge, and this is my kind of criteria, this is like the standard that I hold myself to. There's something called the correspondence principle. It started, uh, it got popularized by uh, Bohr in the early part of the last century, but, uh, and then it kind of evolved. And they, they, it's evolved into a, a general thing that says, if one theory supersedes another, okay, goes, becomes the new better theory, then that new theory needs to be able to make sense of and needs to be able to, you know, be able to account for everything that the previous one was able to do, uh, uh, demonstrate, and, and, and go on. So uh, there's a two key words, subsume and supersede. And subsume just means that the better theory includes all the valid aspects of the uh, prior one. So on the flat, you know, find a flatter theory, rounder theory. So if the... Um, so if once I know that the, that we're on a huge, huge sphere and we're very tiny people, then I say, ah, I can see why people uh, thought that the Earth was flat. And within their experimental stuff, it worked very, very well to be Earth is flat. Okay. So I, I, and, but I, I said, but I don't have to accept that if you go far enough, you're going to fall off the edge of the Earth. Okay. So I, I want the truth content, but I don't want the bad part. So I want, need to be able to understand why they thought that, how they thought that, and why it was successful where it was successful. But I don't have to say, okay. So supersede means that I'm going to understand why it succeeded for them, but I'm going to understand it in a new way. And that is that we were little guys on a very big sphere, okay? So that's the kind of deal. And in order to get to solve this problem in thermodynamics, we need a conceptual revolution, I'm going to argue. So my guy, uh, Thomas Kuhn, uh, did this in, I, I love the, uh, oh, wow, paradigm shift. So the, so this, uh, the guy, when he sees in the egg, you know, he has a whole, that's what my world is. And everything that he, all the experiments that he had inside the egg all work very well. And then, boom, he realized a bigger world. Okay, so uh, that's the kind of idea. So this idea of a special case relationship is throughout. It just means that, that uh, like the flat earth is a special case within the, this large round earth theory. So it works in special areas, okay? Um, and what that means is there's also this, it's an idealization. So the flatness of the earth is an idealization, an approximation, if you like, in a very, on a very large sphere. It works pretty well, but it's an idealization and it's limited. So what I'm going to be arguing tonight is that Boltzmann's thermodynamics is a limited special case within Carnot's more general thermodynamics, okay? So we were a lot of us were taught just the opposite. 
we were taught that Carnot was a special case within Boltzmann. What I'm going to do tonight, I'm going to tell you, show you this other way around and make a good case for that, I think. Uh, and then there's a third option, which actually I'll get to, and I, this is actually the better option. It kind of suggested by what Atkins has said that these two are complementary rather than Carnot eating Boltzmann totally. Carnot needs to develop too. So anyway, uh, the, the third option is like what we found in uh, wave and particle uh, in, in uh, quantum theory, and that is that both, we need a third theory, a more general theory, in which both of these, Carnot and Boltzmann, will both be special cases. Each one of them taken by themselves is a limited, has limited validity, but there's a bigger theory within which they both, we can understand why they both worked, where they worked, okay? Uh, so again, what is thermodynamics? Um, so I'm going to say it's a theory of change. I just kind of mentioned that already, and we've been through this. I think it's a repeat slide here. Okay, so, and and they're basically, you know, usually we say they're, now there are four laws. The first, the zeroth law was added later because we had first, second, third, and then so he said, wait a minute, there's another assumption in there that we're not talking about. And the other assumption or the zeroth law just says, it, it gets into defining what what, uh, what temperature is. It just means if the temperature of this, this, and this, the temperature of A and B are the same, and then temperature of B and C are the same, and C and B are the same. It's like... It, it, one of the things it says is what we mean by temperature is kind of relative to some standard uh, usually. But then we get the third law, which is about absolute zero. Anyway, I'm not going to, the first, the zeroth law and the, and the third law are really not interesting to me tonight. Uh, so the first law is just conservation of energy, okay? That everything, you know, like it's just that same stuff right out of mechanics, that things are conserved. And so the first law is the link to mechan mechanics, okay, is this conservation of energy, conservation of stuff. So you don't, you can't get any energy, and you can't, you're not going to get it, you're going to lose it, it's just there, okay? A uh, second law is what we're going to talk about, which is about, is really about change and how change happens. So uh, I'm going to talk a lot about Boltzmann, but before, uh, just so you won't think Boltzmann is, well, here's the thing, I struggled with this. <laughs> Should I talk about Boltzmann first and then Carnot, or Carnot first and then Boltzmann? Because historically, Carnot is actually before Boltzmann, quite a bit, really. Uh, but then they, there's some overlap of the kind of programs and stuff. But um, I just want to say, so I'm going to start, I'm going to go with Boltzmann first and, 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 and beat up on Boltzmann first. And then if, I'm going to beat up on Boltzmann, but you're going to appreciate it only when you see Carnot. But then I can say, oh, I can show you Carnot first, but you really wouldn't appreciate Carnot until you see what's wrong with Boltzmann. So... That's my dilemma. So, you know, so anyway, I wanted to just say that by the time Boltzmann uh, comes on the scene, there's a lot of stuff we already know. So we already have Clausius, who's kind of like, he's the guy that talk, told a lot of people about Carnot. But the main thing that Clausius's version of the second law was just heat always flows spontaneously, keyword, uh, from hot to cold. So if you have a hot thing and a cold thing, they, you know, goes that one direction. But it also, it doesn't go to cold. It goes to equilibrium. It goes so it's all the same temperature, okay? So equilibrium is key concept too. And this is what Boltzmann is wanting to explain, okay? And he wants to explain it in terms of the motion of atoms, these atoms, okay? So the other thing that Boltzmann knew is this thing, this actually PV equals RT is, is the, is, I'm trying to call it ideal gas law. Uh, it says a pressure times the volume is R is a constant times temperature. So it just means, you know, like if, if uh, you know, if you heat something up, the volume goes up and temperature. So all those things are related. It's not real, you know, uh, if you had high school science 101, you got it. Uh, straightforward stuff. If you hold the temperature constant, uh, P and V vary proportionally. If you hold uh, um, pressure constant, then temperature and volume, you know, very constant. So he knew those two things. He didn't quite have PV equals RT, but that evolved over time. So what Boltzmann came up with is something called the, uh, the kinetic theory of gas. As here's found this nice slide that does it. So these are just like the presuppositions. Every one of these has problems. <laughs> okay, all gases are made of particles. Well, maybe, maybe not. Uh, particles uh, are in constant random motion, colliding with each other. Then, well, there's a lot of problems with that. I mean, what do you mean by random motion? Where did random come from? You know, where, I thought we were all Newtonian. You know, like where did random come from? And uh, 
uh, all collisions are perfectly elastic. It's huge questions about elastic collisions or non-elastic collisions. I won't go into that. Uh, volumes of particles is insignificant. That seems a little strange, isn't it? Uh, there are no interactions between the particles. Wait a minute. I thought the particles are banging into each other up <laughs> in number two there. So there's a problem with that. Uh, oh, sorry. No, no interactions between them as far as, sorry, there's no gravity. So, yeah, idealization is sort of like saying, well, if, you know, the Earth is flat as long as you don't worry about gravity. Wait a minute. Like, what are we leaving gravity out of this? I mean, in gravity, uh, anyway, and there's no electron, there's no repulsion. So, so uh, uh, Bolson's theory is really great, works wonderfully as long as you don't have to worry about gravity or, or uh, electromagnetic interactions. And then it is a key thing, which I'll come back to. The average kinetic energy of the particles is a function of only absolute temperature. That's really the third law, but uh, average is a key per term there. So I'm going to talk about, so I'm going to pick out a few things, just a couple of things that I want to knock on uh, Boltzmann about. Uh, and it's not that I, that this doesn't work in a lot of places, in a lot of ways it does. I just want to say this is just filled with idealizations. This is filled with things that are, you know, not quite true. And that's okay, but we don't want to take it to be fully true. Uh, so anyway, his whole thing only works if you got the thing in a box, okay? And the box is something called adiabatic. It's closed. It's isolated, okay? So his theory of gases and, and, and what pressure is, you know, the pressure of the molecules hitting the sides of the boxes, all that works really, really great as long as you've got an idealized system, uh, an isolated system. Now, the problem is, is there aren't any isolated systems. All systems uh, uh, tend to... I mean, give off something. They dissipate. They have, okay, they fall apart, if you like. Uh, why does he stick with that? Why is that such an important thing? It's bugged me for a long time. It still bugs me a little bit. Why do they bother with this thing? Okay, partly it's because it's linked to the first law and to mechanics. In other words, they don't want that system to be losing any energy because, wait a minute, they're talking about a system where energy is conserved, and if there's energy being lost, and there's a, they got a problem. So they say, oh, well, our theory is founded on this idea that, you know, we're in a closed or adiabatic system, and that it all works really great. Then eh, we can worry about other stuff later. <sighs> Clearly an idealization. Um, all change is spontaneous towards equilibrium. I'm not going to go into that right now. Uh, random motion, I'll get, come back to, no, they're not in random motion. I mean, what do you mean random? So I thought we had Newtonian physics, you know, billiard ball physics, you know, like I hit the billiard ball and it goes, what is he, all of a sudden talking about rand, random particles are in random motion? I mean, now that particles were, you know, okay. So we're going to go into that more. So the first problem, I'm going to say, uh, for Boltzmann thing, and for this way of looking at the universe, is, uh, it's always going toward, it's going from hot to cold. It's going from some difference to sameness. Okay, to, to, it's going from non-uniformity to uniformity. It's going from some difference in temperature or difference in, you know, uh, uh, concentrations if you're in chemistry. And it's going to uniformity. Okay, where did, the, where did this non-uniformity come from in the first place? Okay, and I'll come back to this more, but uh, there is, so the problem is that Boltzmann's thing, everything goes, <laughs> it just flows, this is heat dissipation. I mean, it just dissipates from wherever it is to uniformity. Well, why isn't it in uniformity? I mean, it only has one process. The process is just dispersal. Somebody calls it a dispersal function. So his whole thing about entropy, and you know, it's just a dispersal function. So everything disperses to this, state of equilibrium. Well, where did, what, what makes you think that it wasn't always in equilibrium? Okay, so uh, Sean Carroll, who's been here, and hopefully I'm going to get him back next year, his new book out. Great book. <laughs> it's all about this stuff. And it's something about what they call Bolson Mines, and all. it's really great, great stuff. But one of his things is, okay, so, so Sean says, okay, wait a minute, so if I were just to like, come across a universe, you know, like, pff, we're talking about multi-universe, so I come across a universe, what's the most likely state of that universe going to be? Okay, and it has with the number of particles and the probability of uh, the most, I mean, by far, by like 10 to the God knows what number, it's going to be in equilibrium. So if you have a universe that's not in equilibrium, how are you going to explain that? Okay? Now what I'm saying is, is that if all you, if the whole, the only have one process going on in the universe and that is things moving to equilibrium, if you have a universe that's in non-equilibrium, there's no possible way, no possible way to explain the origin of the non-equilibrium. Okay? So, second problem, randomness. Uh, 
huge topic. So what happened was, this, this, this gets into some somewhat difficult topics that I'm just going to kind of go over. But so in order f to get these particles this, that are in different temperature to go into, to find equilibrium, you need to have a certain bunch of assumptions. And, and, and Boltzmann and Maxwell uh, kind of worked this thing out. There's a longer history to it. I mean, they just said, okay, we'll just say, look, we'll just say that all the molecules are behaving on average. And the average leads them to this thing. I was saying, now what do, how do we define average? Well, it becomes a statistical concept, okay? So that we just, we call ensembles. And they're all, in order to get them to go to the right place. So one of it, otherwise I could just have, you know, this thing here and it goes over there or, go, you know, like if I just got Newtonian, I'd like hit the thing, <laughs> ball goes in the pocket of the billiards. And I'm like, no, this thing's go, always going to this, it's always going to use, <clears throat> excuse me, going to uniformity, okay? So in order to get that, you have to throw in one little assumption, okay? And that is that, that these, that these uh, particles in the gas are all behaving, somebody called it typically. <laughs> typically, what do we mean by that? Well, we mean on average, and what do we mean by average? Well, we mean they're going to a statistical average. They're all, so if you just let them all go, they're all gonna end up in equilibrium. Okay, how they get there? Well, it's statistical. So. This is a problem, and I'm going to come over it. So, this is the first thing. So, this is, and I'm not sure this statement's true, but I just read it and say, well, Boltzmann and, and uh, Maxwell, this is the first introduction of statistical law in physics. Okay, so they're saying, okay, that these particles are governed by statistical laws. Okay, now, so this is a, an article my friend Craig Callender, he's down at, uh, down at UC uh, San Diego. And I, I just asked him about this uh, a few weeks ago at a conference. That it's a collision between dynamics. Dynamics is just the mechanics, okay? It's like stuff going. And sometimes Hamiltonian physics. So Hamiltonian physics is just like you had Galileo, or sorry, you had, um, well, you had Galileo and goes up to Newton and then Newton's laws. Are, so what we now call Hamiltonian physics is just a more sophisticated version of, of uh of uh, mechanics that uh, goes. So anyway, if you talk to physicists today, they'll talk about Hamiltonian physics, dynamics. It's really just the same, you know, uh, Newton stuff, just more sophisticated mathematics and looking at systems and stuff. So, but there's a problem. What he's pointing out here, uh, Craig's pointing out, is that there's a problem between dynamics and thermodynamics, that the dynamics is saying things have definite trajectories. You know, if I hit it this way, it's going to go there. And the statistical f uh, physics says uh, that these are chance governed things. So I'm saying that those, there's a problem between those two. Yeah, I'm going to go a little more. So, so Poincaré, uh, you, you may or may not know of Henry Poincaré. He was huge uh, in physics, uh, I don't know, particularly 1875 to 1925. He did most of what Einstein uh, claimed, you know, a lot of Einstein. Anyway, and later on, so Poincaré realized a long time ago, there's a thing called the three-body problem. So if you're doing Newtonian, if you're doing, um, yeah, Newtonian physics, you wonder, like, they always want to reduce everything down to a couple of points, and then those points are symmetric, you know, and then you can do the problem, okay? If you have a, you know, this thing, well, what's the, if you have this body that's this big and another one that's this big, really hard to do the calculation. If you have three bodies, then it becomes actually impossible to do a, a calculation without making a bunch of approximations, which you can do and people do do. But when you make an approximation, you're doing idealizations again. So it's not what's really happening, it's just your way of approximating. So Poincaré really made a point that classical mechanics and statistical mechanics don't work together. Now there's a lot of hand waving about this, but I'm just that I'm telling you, they don't work together. One of them says definite trajectories, the other one says statistical trajectories. Those are not going to work together. Now, if you're an objectivity guy, if you're going like, okay, well, the universe is governed by one ultimate, you know, order, you're kind of stuck here because you go like, well, which which one is it? You know, like, and some people will give you this subjective thing. Well, the particles and the gas are really traveling. They're really classical mechanical. They're doing Hamiltonian things. But we can't track them all because there's so many of them. They're so small. So we pretend like they're statistical. This is bullshit. Excuse my language. Uh, they just basically, you know, they're, they're incompatible and there's no, you know, it doesn't work. Anyway, and I say, again, following Atkins, maybe they're complementary. 
Uh, so Poincaré came up with what later became, Poincaré came across this, he says, a very small cause uh, which escapes our notice determines considerable effects that we cannot fail to see, and then we say that the effect is due to chance. So there's a chance comes in <laughs> in the theory when the thing doesn't work. Uh, so, so Poincaré is, is uh, um, suggesting that trajectories are not actually completely Hamiltonian, okay? And he discovered this way back, and then he just sort of ignored it. Uh, and it came up again this century, or last century now, uh, the butterfly effect and all this sort of stuff about chaos theory, big thing about chaos theory. Well, Poincaré had it like 100 years ago or 75 years ago. He said, oh, yeah, it isn't that interesting. Um, but that wasn't what was so interesting to him. What was interesting is where he didn't have to worry about it, okay? So the other one, I love this. So uh, Maxwell, uh, he says, this is a book uh, John Barrow got me out of this, uh, that like causes produce like effects is only true when small variations in the initial condition, the initial circumstances, produce only small variations in the final state. Now, you guys have heard of the butterfly effect in chaos theory. So a butterfly flaps its wings in Hong Kong, and such, and such. It's just caught, you know, like 20 years later, there's a hurricane difference in predictions. So it makes it very, very difficult to predict anything. And this is partly the three-body problem. Well, Maxwell has this a long time before. Maxwell's really saying, and this Lemoore is in this book, he edits this, and he makes this comment in the footnote. So this implies that it is only in so far as stability persists, the principles of natural law, same cause, same effect, can be formulated. It is thus perhaps puts a limitation on any postulate of universal physical determinacy, such as Laplace was credited with. Laplace had everything uh, going according to completely deterministic laws. So what this suggests, well, I think he does say it in the next thing. So, um, he's, uh, so Maxwell says, a great many physical phenomena, this condition is satisfied, uh, but there are other cases in which a small initial variation may produce a very great change in the final state of the system. So what he's saying here essentially is that all that nice Newtonian physics and Hamiltonian physics, uh, it works in a lot of cases, okay? As, as long as a small change here doesn't have a small change here. So where it does work is an idealization. Okay, it, work, it has a limited range of validity. Okay? So uh, Lamour says, uh, this can be represented as a range of phenomena. At one end is an idealized linear causal sequence, the same cause, same effect, or, you know, nice Hamiltonian physics, and, and same effect. At the other end is an idealized nonlinear sequence that is historically unique or chaotic. Okay, so again, we got this order and disorder. We got classical mechanics, statistical mechanics. So Maxwell's saying, essentially, yeah, in some cases we have one, in some cases we have the other. All right? And uh, my uh, uh, suggested possible interpretation here, all real particle trajectories have both a classical, mechanical, and a statistical mechanical aspect. That would be nice if we could show that, okay? Then you might, okay. So it kind of sounds like quantum theory in a way. So complementary wave and particles is, well, are things, what is the world made of, particles or waves? Well, it's, you know, everything is a little bit of particle, it's a little bit of waveness. Okay, a little bit of statistical mechanics, a little bit of mechanics. So we'll follow that up later. Uh, so what? Uh, so either, so if you trying to be objective, you know, like science is about objective, what is the objective universe out there? We're kind of stuck here because, uh, if, if, you know, if you want one order governing the universe, uh, you have to choose between those two and you can't because they're not, they're not commensurable. You can't reduce one to the other. You can't express one in terms of the other. Like particles are local and waves are distributed, um, you know, s chaotic things go chaotic and Hamiltonian things go that way. So there's a problem in getting these together. Uh, so third problem, uh, thermodynamics applies only to isolated system. I kind of went through that already. Uh, there aren't any and so forth. Uh, conservation, not a discovery. I mentioned that. It's the symmetry link, action, reaction. No net change. Okay, so the thing is, I get here, is this quantity of energy is always the same, okay? In Boltzmann, in the mechanical view, it's always the same amount of energy. So, John Barrow has this great little book called The Book of Nothing. <laughs> and it's, you know, the energy, so what is, the con okay, if it's all conserved, if the quantity is the same, and John says, well, if you add up all the motions of the universe, and you add up all the charge, you know, positive and negative charge in the universe, they all add up to zero. Okay, that's the, sym that's the symmetry deal. So what is the universe? It's nothing. 
I tell me there was a, there's a funny thing in Woody Allen movie where Woody's worried that the universe is expanding. And I said to John, I said, I mean, the universe doesn't exist then, right? It's like it's nothing. He says, yeah. I said, well, should I be worried about that? And he says, yeah, should be worried about that. <laughs> okay, so, uh, so symmetry means uniformity and the, the saying same everywhere and always. Uh, Maxwell, Boltzmann, equilibrium, statistically uniform. I think this is all repeating. Uh, Oh, so one consequence is, is in these isolated systems of, of Boltzmann, they always have to be in equilibrium. Okay? So if there's any change that's possible, so if everything's supposed to be in equilibrium, then, then and okay, and saying, oh, wait a minute, we happen to be in a universe that's non-equilibrium. I don't have an explanation for that, but I do have that. So what is it that is changing? So clearly the quantity of energy is not changing. So what we say then, is that the quality of the energy is changing, okay? So you might say the, the uh, form of the energy, as people say, the form of the energy, so not, not explaining why we have a non-equilibrium universe, but just say we have one, and it's moving to the equilibrium. What's, what is the change there? Well, it's not the quantity, it's the quality, it's the form, it's changed. So that's a term that gets used a lot. There's no explanation for it because they have no explanation of the non-uniformity. Uh, okay, well, that's just what I said, so... Um, and energy is supposed to be a difference of temperature, origin of the difference is just unexplainable in Boltzmann. Uh, and they, they have a funny way of responding to this. They say, oh, well, it, look, so it looks like, it was like, well, how did this planet get here? And what are we all be doing here? Where did all this stuff come from? So, well, it's a, it's, a, it's a statistical fluctuation. Okay, so when there's sort of like, there's a, there's so things that order like that we have in this room and so forth. So that's a, that's a, that's like going the wrong way in terms of, you know, increasing entropy. That's a decrease in entropy. Well, there's a decrease there. There's somewhere else in the universe is an increase and it's, you know, uh, it's a statistical law, right? So the, all these particles, everything in the universe is behaving according to the statistical law. So sometimes it can go, you know, statistical fluctuation. Uh, I'm not buying that. Um, do I go into it here or no? I'm not going to worry about it. So anyway, but, all right, so I'm just going to go on. I'll come back to that. So, so I like Sommerfeld. So just so you, if you're not frustrated by those, yeah. So Sommerfeld says, thermodynamics is a funny subject. First time you go through it, uh, you don't understand it at all. Second time you go through it, you think you understand it, except for one or two small points. So the third time you go through it, you know you don't understand it. But by that time, you're used to it, and it doesn't bother you anymore. <laughs> this is pretty much, I think this is experience of just about everybody who's gone through thermodynamics. He keeps straying. I don't understand, I don't understand, but I, you know, you figure out how to work the problems and how to do this, and there's that assumption and that idealization. But yeah, I can do those kind of, you know, like, you play around with it, but in the end, you're like, okay, so I can work the problems if it doesn't make any sense. And what bothered me are things like the, the, the piston in the, engine is moving infinitely slowly. And I go like, wait, wait a minute. I mean, is this, this is 1984. This is double talk. I mean, either it's moving or it's not moving. It can't be moving infinitely slowly. I mean, it's like, anyway. So, uh, okay, I'm just going to go real quick on these. So, uh, for uh, reversibility, uh, Brian Green has this great thing in Fabric of the Universe. There's a thing called Lofschmidt's paradox, and, and Boltzmann knew about this. He just said, yeah, it's interesting, but I don't care because my formula is too wonderful. And uh, Lofschmidt's thing, he said, okay, well, if everything's dispersing like that, how did it get there? And this is back to the how do we, you know, why isn't the universe in equilibrium from somewhere else, or why didn't it come from non-equilibrium to equilibrium? Anyway, it gets complicated. But it basically is just reversibility. You know, classical physics is supposed to be reversible. And if everything's going this way, this quality thing, well, how in the hell is that going on? So Green says... When I first encountered this idea many years ago, it was a bit of a shock. Up until that point, I had thought I understood the concept of entropy fairly well. But the fact of the matter was that following the approach of textbooks I'd studied, I'd only considered entropy's implications for the future. And as we just uh, have just seen in the book, you can read it, uh, while entropy applies towards the future confirms our intuitions and experience, entropy applied towards the past is just, just as certainly contradicts them. It wasn't quite as bad as suddenly learning that you've been betrayed by a longtime friend, but for me, it was pretty close. I asked Brian about this later, and he said, yeah, that's, he said that was my, he said it was like that. Okay, fifth problem, so um, this dispersal, I'm not going to go in, into this, I don't need to. It's just that there's, you know, it's one of the ideals, there's no gravity, he doesn't, you know, the whole thing doesn't talk about gravity at all. I mean, 
Craig Callender, my friend at UCSD, talks about this a lot. He's like, wait a minute, what if we, put, what if these particles are, have gravity, you know, like the mass or something, it doesn't work. Okay, so, um, so one, two, three, four, five. So I've gone through these. Is it worried, you know, like, Where's the non-equilibrium come from? The statistical mechanics versus classical mechanics problem. Uh, there are no isolated systems. The bit only works in isolated systems and quality quantity thing. No real work going on. The reversibility paradox and no force of attraction. Okay, yeah. So now into the good good guys. So this has been one of the most fun things. So I a number of years ago I started looking up. I came across. I went to went to Paris and I got, had to go to the Ecole Polytechnique, which is where Sadi Carnot and actually Lazare Lazare Carnot also went to school. This is the first engineering. He's represented the first engineering university in the world in Paris. And I'm going. I, I kind of keep coming across this guy Lazare, and I just everything. Everybody goes back. Well, thermodynamics started with Sadi Carnot, and I. So who's this guy Lazare? You know, like and he was one of Napoleon's generals. He's got a really interesting guy. So I look him up a little bit, and he has, he has this 537-page treatise on the calculus, published, like, I think seven years before Saadi was born. And I go, like, wait a minute. Maybe Lazari is the guy who, you know, was a real deep thinker. And, 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 and Saadi dies at, like, 37 or something like that. He's really young. So I look into this a little bit, and I, I'd love to go into that. I mean, I just... So one of the things I was going to mention, so Lazari has, a, has an essay called on Theory of Engines, and he sees the world in terms of engines, okay? And, and, uh, and, any, and, he, and he talks about two things. In any engine that accelerates and shocks of the moving parts all represent losses of the moment of activity. It's a really crucial thing in, in uh, engineering thermodynamics has to do with this loss, okay? And I pointed out here, I'm not going to go into it, but it turns out that this is, and he, see, he concludes, this is why perpetual motion machines are impossible, is because of this loss, okay? Remember, he, isolated systems can't have any loss? Well, in the engineering one, it's all about the loss and why you have loss. So I'm just pointing out, it just seems to have come originally from him, and <laughs> I figured I actually figured that out a few years ago, and I actually gave a seminar at Portland State about this. I didn't know anything about this, but, uh, and I haven't found his book yet, but I'm going to find it and uh, read it. He's got a couple others too. So Saudi uh, son comes on the scene. Um, he, he publishes this book. Actually, uh, um, Lazari dies in that same year, 1823. This book, uh, Saudi publishes a book called Reflections on the Motive Power of Fire. And what Saudi's does, what Saudi's on to, so Lazari is about collisions and things going on in machines and accelerations. So Saudi's into... Uh, getting work from heat. Okay, now up until this point, we've got it, we've been dealing with fire for a long time. Okay, we do a lot of things with fire. But we never got, we never were able to produce organized work, organized motion from this fire going, you know, dispersing. So that was the big deal. Okay, so steam engines, like how can you, know, like steam, you know, it's coming off all this sort of stuff. How do you get, how do you get motion? How do you generate things? useful work from this waste, okay? So what was waste now becomes, and that was kind of the big deal. And Saudi, I mean, he didn't know, he didn't discover this. This was coming on, but he, he studies it. And, he's, and he realizes this particular formula. It just says the efficiency of any machine, any engine, is it's uh, the hot temperature versus minus the cold temperature divided by the hot temperature. And you figure that out, it means it always has to be less than one, okay? So efficiency is always less than one. This means that there must be a loss in any kind of work. So anytime you have an engine, there's always got to be a loss. Now, if you think about this, I said, I, mean, I thought about it right first. Why couldn't I make a machine that, that didn't have a loss, okay? And I want you to, if you contemplate that, if you go to the mechanics, not at all clear why you can't do it. You got motion going around, things happening. So Saudi's saying, no, you can't, nothing moves, nothing happens without this loss, okay? Going back to what I was saying about the Hamiltonian, and maybe there's a, when something goes in motion, maybe it has a Hamiltonian component and a statistical component. So it's just, okay, it's a split here. So anyway, Saudi extends, I would say, he makes a generalization of, of, uh, Lazari's work, okay? So he's actually going on, Lazari's talking about kinetic stuff, 
things banging into each other and Saudi's extending it into this new area where you're, this waste heat is now actually, as long as we put it in a box and do stuff with it, we can get uh, work out of it, which is really novel. Uh, okay, and another thing about that Saudi figures out is that what he's discovered is not just true of steam engines, or he calls heat engines, uh, temperature engines, it's true of all engines, all possible engines, regardless of the design or the materials used, they're all, they're, the work they produce will always be less than, than one, efficiency, okay? That's a big deal. Okay. Uh, and I invite you to train the, now if this wasn't the case, you'd have perpetual motion, which is part of the deal. And one of the things you say about it, if you go back to the mechanical model, you know, whether it's come from non-equilibrium to equilibrium, it's like that energy doesn't ever go away. So the, it's kind of like that the mechanical model of the universe is a perpetual motion machine. It just changes the form. But it's kind of perpetual motion. Craig Callender asks us, why can't I make a perpetual motion machine? But I think if mechanics is true, everything's a perpetual motion. Sadi says, no, it's not. It's a complete, uh, you know, all that idea of, of uh, mechanical motion is an idealization. It only works in certain circumstances. And in every circumstance where there's motion, there's this loss. Really revolutionary stuff. Uh, so the thing he's saying is, is all change, is this something, all change, thermodynamics about change, all change is a result of real work. And what I mean by real work is Carnot work, okay? where there's this split. And that's his big paradigm shift. Okay, so uh, I'm going to read I'm just going to read this real quick. But I mean, I'm not going to read it. Basically, this is, these are the opening lines of Saudi's book. Okay, and basically it says, all, this he, all these heat engines, he sees the biosphere as made up of engines. Okay, the, 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 the uh, ocean currents and the rain going up and coming down and you know, all these things, all this motion, all these things are, these are engines. These are heat makes the go up and then the water comes, you know, like uh, it comes down. We use the water for things and, and, and all that stuff. And now uh, it's in the end and now we've managed to, as, as part of this system, we're able to take some of it out for our uses, okay? But the main thing I might just get to is that his view of the, Biosphere is, uh, is one of engines. Okay, so what he's saying then, this is what I call Carnot's epiphany, <laughs> is, uh, and I'm gonna, I can't see where Saudi has actually said, I think I got it from one of his commentators, but Carnot's epiphany is that we are not, so the Newtonian idea was that there's this clockwork, like everything's connected to everything else. Every cause has an effect, da, 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 and it's all mechanical. So, okay, so Saudi's saying, no, 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 no. We're not, we're not part of a, of a clockwork mechanism, okay? We're not like, you know, robots in a robot, you know, and I think that's not the deal, you know? Because uh, the mechanics is 100% efficient. The classical mechanics is supposed to be 100% efficient. But you say, no, that's an idealization. Real motion, real change is not 100% efficient. And then he notes that we are, and this comes from Priestley and these guys, all of a sudden it realizes that humans are engines. You know, we're like little flames. Okay, and we're burning. We're heat engines, and we burn. We need fuel, and we burn the fuel, and we get work out of that. So he realizes that we're engines in a world of engines. Okay, we are engines. Plants are engines. The ocean's an engine. The atmosphere's got engine things going on. We're just, okay. So, and then, of course, which I'll go on to, we're engineers. Not only engines, but we're engineers. We're doing things. You know, what engines do is they do things. And so we're engineers in a world of engineering. That's his... I'm missing. And another way, some people say we're agents in a world of agency. Uh, so, uh, does Carnot's thermodynamics supersede Boltzmann? I'm saying yes, of course it does. Uh, it, it, because all of, all of the stuff of Boltzmann, whether, whether you're using the classical mechanics or the statistical mechanics, it's all based on idealizations. Okay, the clear things are clearly not true. But, but what I would say with, with Carnot is he has Carnot motion has both aspects, okay? It's just like, kind of like the wave particle thing. So it's like, oh, the universe is such that it has both those things going on at the same time. But if it does, then you can't understand what's going on by either classical mechanics or statistical mechanics alone, which makes mechanics ambiguous, okay? All right, so, um, so repeating stuff. Um, 
all work is dissipation, all is lost, always less than one, efficiency change, it depends. So one of the studies things supposedly is that it is really noting that the only thing you need to know in order to know the efficiency of a machine, the, the potential efficiency, is the temperature. You can have the most brilliant design in the world, but you're always limited by the difference in the temperature. You can be always, a lot of times you're a lot less than that, but that's the theoretical limit, upper limit. Um, so these are, uh, Clausius this comes a little bit later. I'm just gonna mention these quickly. And Clausius is just emphasizing this spontaneous thing. Okay, so when you do have a difference, and you hear this a lot of people talk about them, well, the second law of thermodynamics is all, you know, like everything goes, differences to sameness, okay? But then it would never really explain where the differences come from, of course. Uh, but right now, the main thing is, is what Clausius was on about is you never see a situation where things go from a cold body to a hot body. You never see that transfer of energy going in that direction. It always seems to go in that direction. And that's one of the really fundamental characteristics of thermodynamics that makes it different. It's somehow, you don't see in mechanics, it's you know, action, reaction stuff. Here, there's something basically fundamentally different. And that's kind of what Clausius is grabbing at a little bit. He had a lot more to say about him. And uh, Kelvin, Lord Kelvin, is another one of the giants in the field. Uh, and this is something I'd love to go into further. No cyclic process is possible in which heat is taken from a hot source and converted completely into work. This is the loss thing, okay? Uh, cyclic process is really, I mean, I've just been digging into that. I don't want to say too much about it tonight, but I will a little bit. Uh, now, one thing I have to say is like, in all these guys, in the engineering tradition, which really comes before Boltzmann. None of them say any, I mean, Kelvin's way later, he goes, he clashes with these guys. They never talk about atoms or particles. Okay, they're always talking about processes and engines doing this and laws. They never talk about particles. Okay? So it's kind of, we call it process thermodynamics. So it's my friend, he just sent me an email saying he loved it, what I was saying. But so this is Robert uh, Yolanda, he got his PhD in, uh, in uh, uh, chemical engineering. He says, in answering the mandatory thermodynamics question in my chemical engineering PhD orals, orals at John Hopkins, he said, if I'd said anything about particles <laughs> rather than processes, the next day I would have been out looking for a job in real estate. Okay, the point is, is that, the, and I, I looked into this a lot, but basically there's two different educational tra traditions in this. So if you, if you were engineer, if you were taught as an in, by engineers, real practical engineers, you're very likely that you would have got the process model. If you, if you were taught by physicists and stuff, you would have got the particles pro deal, okay? And there's coming, so what, what, I just talked to Robert about this, he volunteered the story to me. He said like, yo, I mean, like where I was in engineering, I mean, you talk about that stuff. So, so here's another guy. This guy, Steve Klein, who's written a bunch of this stuff. So Steve, is, he, he was a, a Stan, an engineer out at Stanford, unfortunately passed away, did a lot of good stuff. But Klein says, is, is when discussing thermodynamics, when someone brings up entropy, shoot them. <laughs> and entropy is all about, you know, the particles. That's what Boltzmann is, all the particles. There is, you just shoot them because, okay, so what is he So standard thermodynamics, which he's talking about Boltzmann stuff, and the, people get a standard thermodynamics, so the thermodynamics spend their time modeling the creation of manure with which little with it's supposed to be with little or no concern for the horse. So what he's saying is that the Boltzmann guys are all concerned with that one thing going to the dispersal. Okay, everything's going towards. Okay, so it goes if there's this order which they don't have any explanation how it came about. It goes to disorder. The disorder is the waste. It's the manure. There's no idea about how that's coming about or anything. They they have no. They don't think about, they don't refer to the engines at all, or the work, the horse, okay? So that's his basic point. So most of the thermodynamicists are in that Boltzmann tradition, they're just saying, oh, entropy increases, therefore, and everything gets interpreted in that model, and they don't see any, uh, they don't bother talking about uh, how that's happening. More, much more to be said about that, but. Okay, work, uh, constant work and energy, real quick. Work in Boltzmann is symmetric, uh, action and reaction. Uh, net zero, conservation, I've already been through that. All mechanical systems, basically all mechanical systems are zero sum games. This goes through, I was talking to Brian Green about this, like thermodynamics is in everything. So every science, everything he wants to call itself a science, most of them model themselves on mechanics. So if you guys have heard some of my earlier lectures, um, Economics. You want to be a science in economics? Then it has to be zero sum. 
Okay, what does economics do? It always goes to equilibrium. Supply and demand always goes to equilibrium. Okay, I've talked about the big one of the big paradigm changes in economics is this guy Paul Romer, where they see, wait a minute, <laughs> why is the equilibrium point, you know, increasing? It's supposed to just all be going to equilibrium. Why is that happening? And and it turns out it's it's engines and technology. Uh, so it actually, the universe actually is going somewhere. Uh, Carnot, uh, all change requires work, work being inefficient, work bifurcates. And this is about, so when I say bifurcates, it means that whenever, whenever anything happens, there's always these two aspects. There's the work and the loss. Okay, there's what you did and the exhaust. Okay, and the crucial thing is that the work and the loss have to be incommensurable. The loss has to be qualitatively different from the work. Because if it wasn't, then I could recapture that loss in the service of the, of the work agenda, okay? And then I would have a perpetual motion machine, okay? And all perpetual motion machine inventions, you see pretty much all of them make that same mistake. The other thing they don't realize is that loss is in fact of a different type than the action, okay? And this is, this, again, this, order disorder thing, okay? The order, you can't capture the disorder and bring it back in the service of the order, all right? So that's why you don't have perpetual motion. Uh, anyway, saying it anyway. Okay, the other thing about Carnot work is it generates a net change, okay? So in, in, uh, in uh, mechanics, action, reaction, da, 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 da. so net change zero. But in, in uh, Carnot, it doesn't, Carnot doesn't go like this. Carnot goes like that. Okay, so Carnot actually creates changes. Okay, so it actually is a theory of change. It's like everything's changed. Everything's doing work. Everything's, you know, okay. So it's a theory of that. And, and every time, so there's a thing about the heat death. So supposedly in, 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 um, in uh, Boltzmann, you know, it's like, oh, well, somehow you make the heat is ordered universe at the Big Bang, and it's going to total equilibrium. Equilibrium they call the heat death. That's when the temperature of the universe is uniform everywhere. Okay, now they want to know why, how it ever started. I mean, as Sean Carroll says, there should always be that, okay, digital temperature. But with Carnot, every time it uses a, a, a gradient, uses energy, uses a difference, it creates a difference. Uses a difference, creates a difference, uses a difference, creates a difference. And that's a cumulative process, okay? Uh, I mean, probably not enormously obvious, but I'll come back to it. Uh, so work in Carnot, because it is this theory of change, has a, first of all, it has a history, obviously, but at the other point is it has a cumulative history. So every time work's done, there's a new difference is created, okay? Now I'm going to say, why isn't everything just different? Okay, well, there's a reason for that, which I'll come to. So, and it, what, is a, what, is, <laughs> what is the evidence that Carnot is right? Well, we actually have a universe. Remember John Barrow's thing, add everything up? What do you got? Nothing. Okay. Okay. Why? Where's? What evidence is there to support Carnot's theory? All the possible evidence you can cite. Everything. You know, there is no evidence in favor of nothing. Okay. Everything. The fact that Carnot's uh, thermodynamics is correct, it gives us a universe. The universe is creating, unfolding. Okay, it's emerging. All right. So uh, Carnot's thermodynamics theory of change is a cumulative history. Uh, okay, so time. So time in in the Boltzmann thing is just like, oh, time. You know, let's take time is from increasing entropy. So this from whatever wherever his order came from to disorder, and then it's order. Then maybe time ends or something stupid. So their idea is that that time is defined by this hot to cold thing. You know, that that somehow we've come from who knows why, you know, the fairy godmother or whoever created this difference. And when we go to sameness, we go to the heat death. And that direction is the direction of time. So increasing entropy defines the direction of time. Wrong. Okay. What time is, is time is, is constructed. Okay. It's this process that Carnot's talking about. And it's a little more sophisticated than that that I'll get into. So time evolves, time unfolds, time emerges, okay? It's con time is constructive, okay? So the, why is the past still here in some sense? It's because it's cumulative and constructive. All right, um, how am I doing? I'm getting a little tight on time here. So, um, actually, incommensurable, okay, already, it makes, um, 
Good thing I get into. Uh, so what is motion? Motion in mechanics is just, initially at least, it's Hamiltonian. Or, no, maybe it's statistical motion. And what uh, Lazare and Poincaré and Maxwell are all saying is that, no, mechanical motion is an idealization. Real motion is what we're seeing in work, the performance of work. Real motion is different. So motion, I say, oh, they have two theories of motion. No, what's meant by motion in mechanics is mechanical motion. What's meant by motion in, in uh, Carnot uh, involves work. You don't get in motion, you don't get any change without being work, and it's different, something different happening. Okay, so real quick, energy, I've kind of been through this. So, what, okay, definition of energy, go, to, go into Atkins, what is energy? He says, well, it's kind of like, eh, there's a lot of like, hand waving about what is energy. Well, for, you know, you, uh, John Barrows, he had all the energy up in the universe is nothing. So what it comes to conservation of nothing. It's like, what is energy? It's a little problem. So, the, the, but in practice, energy is, uh, is the ability, their capacity, their potential to perform work. Okay. Now, if you just do it in a in the simple mechanical physics thing, you raise a brick one foot in a in a gravitational field, and it goes back and forth and back and forth and back and forth, and you know, whatever, it doesn't go anywhere in the end. It's like net sum zero. Uh, but in but so anyway, if you stick with the ability and potential to do work, uh, because there's no energy in the in the in the Boltzmann thing, there's no real work. This thing. Okay, so. Uh, bu 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 through this. So energy in Carnot is actually, I'm just going to say the same thing, it's cumulative, uh, it has a product, the product is in fact the universe. Okay, now I'm going to talk about the material transformation. So initially in Boltzmann, these particles, I said they didn't have any gravity, they didn't have any electric charge on them, they're just like, they actually don't have any, any size, I mean they're kind of like crazy. But real world thermodynamics doesn't deal with those. It deals with real matter. Okay. So what I want to do here real quick is to say, well, wait a minute, where's, what is real matter? And where did it come from? And how's it going? So uh, I call it the material transformation for lack of a better word. So, um, so, okay. So Carnot work creates product, creates structures, it creates functions. Oh, and the main thing is, okay, so Newtonian particles don't have any energy. In other words, in order for a Newtonian or both money particle to move, it has to be hit by something else, okay? It doesn't have any ability to move in itself. Okay, going to Brownian motion, but don't worry about that right now. It, it always has external causes, okay? Okay, in real world, thermodynamics, or real chemistry, real world, uh, matter has internal energy. So there's energy in the thing. Uh, okay, so this is just saying the same thing. So, uh, so where did, all this, where did all this matter come from? So Steve Weinberg is in his great book, First Three Minutes, which is a big bang. And, just, and he has a series, what he says is we have a series of what he calls symmetry, spontaneous symmetry breaking events. So we go like, okay, here's what it was all light and everything, and then the light turned into something else, and then that turned into something else, and that, then we had electrons, and that turned into that, and then we, got, we go up. So all these, these are like symmetry breaking. So like, if your basic, explanatory framework is mechanics, and mechanics presupposes symmetry as your explanatory framework, there is no possible way to explain a series of symmetry-breaking events. Get over it, okay? It ain't gonna happen. All right, so, uh, one of the things about stellar evolution that you see is the product, so these stars, you know, you know, you guys, you know, as a star goes, there's hydrogen, helium stars, and they blow up, and they, it gives, they spread that stuff all over, and that forms next generation of stars, and then those stars make things up until they get iron. They're burning stuff, they get iron, and then that blows up, and they get supernova, and then they, and we're, you know, we're fairly well down the thing. So the point is, is and, and there's all that light going out, all that waste light, but that waste light is not waste light. And those things that it spews out is not waste, okay? It creates them, it blows them out, and it goes through some sort of generational thing. So the waste is fuel. This is kind of the thing with steam engines, this realization that what we thought was waste is actually fuel by, for some other process, okay? So some complementary process, perhaps. Okay. Uh, stars are nuclear engines. Their product is matter. Oh, well, this is weight. Okay, so... Um, so into biology a little bit. So evolution of the biosphere. We've got evolution of cosmos. Evolution of the biosphere. 
uh, Sagan and Snyder, great little book called Into the Cool. Uh, and basically, they, their thing was the biosphere is an engine. Okay, so this is a nice thing. You've got the sun as the heat source and the outer space is the, is the cold sink. You get this like with the CO2 stuff that people are talking about. Well, the earth is this engine. It's doing work. Okay, Get, so the sun and the sun is the hot source and the space is the cold sink. And there's this heat. The earth is a heat engine in the middle. And that for them, the main thing they see is that the engine develops over time. You get the Watt engine, you get Newcomb engine. The engine gets better and better. And what does it get better and better at doing? It gets better and better at increasing capacity to perform work. So remember my definition of energy? Increasing capa capacity to perform work. So this engine, as it gets better and better, it somehow it's like it's creating energy or it is more energy or it has more access to energy. Somehow the energy content of the universe, in fact, the universe itself, is in fact coming forth through the process of work somehow. Uh, footnote, these, the Odoms have this way down. But anyway, so uh, and I thought a lot about this guy in the middle of the heat engine, which I'll come back to. Uh, so, so one of the ways to see this, so I, I, earlier lectures, O2, CO2, you see these two processes going on, the O2 producers and the CO2 producers, and each one is feeding the other. So our waste, our CO2, becomes fuel for the plants, and the plants give off the oxygen, which is fuel for us. Okay, so similar kind of relationship. It's a dynamic equilibrium. Uh, and the word equilibrium is really interesting. The word equilibrium in, uh, in uh, if you take a course in thermodynamics right now, they, they use the word equilibrium, but it's really kind of funny use of the word equilibrium. They don't mean mechanical equilibrium. They mean a kind of a thermal equilibrium, which I want to argue to you is actually a dynamic equilibrium, and, and a better word would be homostasis, okay? In other words, that there's these, that somehow when something's stable, when if something's there, uh, a thing or whatever it is, it, it has actually, it's, it's equilibrium is like a dynamic equilibrium of complementary process, so that that idea of the biosphere is a kind of a, what you call it, a token of the type. Okay, I want to say that all real things have that sort of structure to them. Uh, so homostasis comes through that whole idea in 1932. Uh, then uh, um, Lovelock and so forth come up with the idea that the Earth itself is, ex okay. And then, so mechan as I say, mechanical equilibrium gets translated in Carnot this is like, under, you know, we understand it, we understand it in a new way, and the new way is to see it as a homostatic, reciprocal, cyclic processes. Anybody in chemistry, Onsager, reciprocals, get into this. Uh, bu -bu 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 -bu. So, so Carnot, what I call Lovelock's problem is like, okay, well, the biosphere, not only is it getting more and more powerful, but it's also stable, what's it doing? And... Uh, and if, if the world were like Boltzmann, it should just be, everything should blow apart. In fact, it shouldn't be anything. There shouldn't be any things at all. It should just be like, whoosh. So why are there things? And if you look at chemical thermodynamics, they talk about barriers to reactions. You know, like, why does this reaction go off? You know, why doesn't this, this computer just dissolve into, you know, why does this disperse? <laughs> and I see, uh, actually I have a quote from Grossman, I think, here somewhere. I'll get back to it. Anyway, you know, like, okay, so, so here's a question I'm raising. We're getting into the fun stuff here. I'm sorry I'm running a little late, but what is a thing? Okay, so Boltzmann's thing is like, and it kind of looks like there aren't even really particles because they don't really interact with each other. So it more looks like just this radiation. Bleh. So why do we have things? Why are there things in the world? Okay, and what is a thing? And so I want to say that things are engines, and they're engines like the Earth's biosphere, okay? Okay. So they're not clockworks. Boom. Okay. So this is what I get to. So Boltzmann thermodynamics has nothing to say about this, the creation of things. This has nothing to say about it at all. And, uh, and it also doesn't have anything to say about these barriers. So it doesn't have anything to say about why things come about and why they're stable. Okay. Why, why do things hold together? Why are they stable? And uh, this, uh, this course, great little, one of the great courses, if you want to get into this stuff by, uh, uh, the great courses are good, thermodynamics by this guy, this MIT professor, uh, Jeffrey Gross, Grossman, and he says, when he says, uh, thermodynamics has nothing to say about barriers to reactions. He said nothing, we don't talk about it. 
Okay, doesn't have anything to say about it. No contribution. Okay, so why is anything stable? So this question goes way back. So uh, I think there was a prize that King of, I don't know, Bavaria or something said, why is the solar system stable? Why is, and is it stable? Why does it just keep, you know, they, why is it this nice clockwork and it's always the same and the orbits do the same thing? Why is it stable? Because aren't there disturbances and comets come through and all this sort of stuff? And so Laplace, this guy Laplace goes through and he says, well, all the variations, all the like little disturbances all add up to zero. So that's why, in other words, like you say, there's a, so we have a, thing going along, we say, here's this thing going along, nice Hamiltonian, nice trajectory, but it has a little, few little variations, but the variations all add up to zero, so it's nice, stable trajectory. Okay. Uh, so, but, but, okay, and the simple thing is that the reason that argument's not right is because those uh, fluctuations, those variations are different from the Hamiltonian trajectory. They're incommensurable. They're different type of things. So, you know, he's adding together, you know, particles and waves in order to get particles and it doesn't work. Uh, all right, so anyway, my thesis in a lot of this is that uh, Carnot is more general. The, all of mechanics are idealizations. Carnot is actually giving us something where we see how the uh, classical mechanics and statistical mechanics both work in Carnot. They work together according to these different things he's laid out and they, uh, and they, they, uh, so he supersedes. It's a more general, Carnot's a more general theory that allows us to explain why classical mechanics is, works where it works and why statistical mechanics works where it works and why in all real cases there's an element of both of them. Okay. Um, okay, so anyway, just real quick. So, uh, so well, we're giving, making, you know, we have to, our bodies, I had a bunch of stuff on that, but the body makes proteins. I had another bunch of good slides for you on that, but but it's always, everything is being, what is about the fundamental things, okay? So about the stability of the atoms. Now in mechanics right now, we had this theory we developed in the 20th century, a theory of, you know, I don't know if you guys followed the, the whole uh, Heisenberg and Bohr and this guy, Bohr, you know, the, the electrons are going around the nucleus and all this sort of stuff. Well, if that's happening, then it should be radiating. It's not radiating. Why isn't it radiating? Well, we don't know. So maybe we just assume that it doesn't radiate and, and reform it. Anyway, a bunch of really funny hand-waving stuff went on, and they still couldn't figure out why atoms don't just fall apart, okay? Because there's stuff going on, and they don't fall apart, and they're really stable. And, uh, and you can crush them, you can fire them around, you can do all that, and they're just stable as hell. So why are they stable? So, so actually Weinberg and much of the guys, they go into all this mumbo jumbo stuff about virtual particles, you know, trying to balance all this stuff so that they don't blow up. And so they come up with this thing, they got Nobel Prizes for it and everything like that. Well, one of the implications of this virtual particles thing is that the deep space, these particles should be popping in and out of existence. And if you actually, if you fire something through, quote unquote empty space, it runs into these particles sometimes, you know, they're virtual, but they come in, they have a certain amount of time that they exist and then they go out of existence. And these things are bumped into it. And there's, there's a guy up at U University of British Columbia called UNRWA, U-N-R-U-H, it's thing called UNRWA radiation. So he fires this thing through empty space and it gets a kind of a bow shock, okay? And it heats up the front end or where the direction is going and gives off what's called UNRWA radiation. And you can measure this, it goes on. Anyway, when you measure the vacuum of space, based on this idea, this mechanical model of the stability of the atom, it's off by 10 to the 120th. That's not a small error, okay? And uh, Paul Davies has a great book, I think it's called Gold, Goldilocks Thing, is the latest one he did. But this is out there and people just go like, oh, really? Hmm, how about that? So, um, so my, my hypothesis here, my, this is reaching out, is simply that, that uh, the stability of the atom is going to turn out to be like the stability of the, of the biosphere. It's going to be that atoms are somehow uh, stable because of these complementary processes. Okay, so I looked at this, I don't know what came up this like last week or two, and I kept, I've looked at that diagram forever. Okay, there's a heat source, and there's a, and, and, and all of a I realized that you can't get any work out of that difference in temperature unless there's something there in the middle that's very special. Something that can produce, something that can perform work. Okay? 
So you can't get work unless you have a worker. Okay? No work can be formed without a worker. Things in the world are workers. They're engines, and they have internal energy. So Carnot's epiphany, remember, was that we're engines in a world of engines. We're engineers in a world of engines. We're, in, we're workers in a world of workers. Okay? We're metabolic engines in a world of engines. So the only reason that things can go on is because we got that. So that's great. But I don't, I don't have a slide for this. So basically the reason, but we got the workers, we have two workers. We have workers are producing oxygen, workers are producing carbon dioxide. So it's not just one type of work. It's that these work together. Okay, but workers are really, the idea that things are workers is really important because that's why they fall apart over time, okay, because there's always a loss. I mean, even though the atoms are stable, they always have radioactive thing. They always, everything falls apart. Um, so here's the final thing here. So I, I kind of knew this. I remember saying it to somebody like five or six years ago. There's this link between Carnot and quantum theory, okay? And both of them are participant theories. So obviously Carnot, I mean, this is the participant. We're in the middle, okay? That, that, that's what a participant is, is a worker, okay? We're all workers. We're workers in this world of working. So we're participants in the universe, okay? So what happened with quantum theory was they said, well, the universe is either it's, you know, it's, it's particles or waves. Well, what is it? Well, it depends on how you look at it. And it's not like one or the other. It's this range of, you know, everything has a little bit of particle and has a little bit of waveness. Confusing, but how the universe goes forward, okay? How does the universe go forward? Because you have this thing called Schrodinger's wave function, okay? Schrodinger's wave function simply defines a potential. The potential kind of just sits there and Somebody said it spins in Hilbert space or something. It doesn't really do anything. It doesn't ever actualize this. It's just potential. What gets the potential to go forward? What makes the universe go forward? What, how do we get one experiment rather than another experiment? Well, it has to have a choice. Somebody has to make a choice. Okay? Well, the choice, in fact, is what the worker does. So what I say is that, is that quantum theory is also a participant theory. And in fact, I mean, so what happened in quantum theory is I'm going to say, well, what, it, what is the world? And there's this thing I need to do all the time I have from Lee Smolin. In 2010, he goes like, well, in the, six, in the 70s when my generation was coming into physics, um, we were really excited about coming up and figuring out what reality, you know, deep reality really was. And, and because, of, you know, the origina originators of quantum theory, you know, they hadn't figured it out. And, you know, we were the new kids on the block and we we're going to do it. And so we were really excited about that. And the 70s and 70s, this is now 2010, this is when he made this comment. 2010, he's become rather Kafka esque. If you don't know Kafka, it's like a guy, guy who woke up and found he was a cockroach. It's kind of weird. In other words, the point is, the situation is very weird. He says, we've made no progress whatsoever. So my saying here is a reason for that is they're trying to cram quantum theory into mechanics, and it ain't going to go. The only thing, you know, if you go to the Carnot's, meta, if you go to Carnot's thermodynamics, quantum theory just falls out immediately. They actually did the same thing. Okay, and the last thing, so Heisenberg got me onto this. He has a little book called Physics and Philosophy, and Heisenberg talks about this thing called the collapse of the wave function, and he said, you know, well, what, the, you know, what idea is the world is, the way to understand this is the world is made up of what he calls, what he called actual potentials. Okay, so this is what a worker says. A worker is like an actual potential. And then he refers to Aristotle. He said Aristotle used that term. The world's made up of these actual potentials. Now, what's an actual potential? So, so, and this goes back to the cyclic thing. So, I have homo I'm homostatic, and I'm coming at temperature, my salinity, all these things, you know, oxygen levels. Anyway. So, I mean, there's a huge number of homostatic properties that I got that my body, you know, keeps things like that. Now, when I do some work, my body readjusts, comes back. I burn something, but it comes back to that, okay? Cycles back. So the worker thought here is that work is always a cycle, and workers are always things that are doing cyclic things, from humans to atoms. They're always doing cyclic things. The whole thing about the origin of cycles in the universe. So. So what Heisenberg's saying is the world is made up of these actual potentials, but you've got actual potential and actual potential. So you guys are actual potentials. I'm actual potentials, but we're kind of working together. Um, let me get, finish off here. i got about two slides left. Uh, so in...
quantum theory, you say, well, you know, do you set up the experiment to show the particle aspect or do you show it up, set it up to do the wave aspect? Well, those are two different actions. Each of those actions, of course, has a history to it. Uh, and those histories, those choices, so if I choose to set up a particle experiment, then I go into a different universe where I did that. So the history. So quantum theory is a naturally has a natural historical aspect to it as well, as does uh, uh, Carnot thermodynamics, and that so that choice is there. But another thing I would say is that they this choice idea in quantum theory is really really they're really really uncomfortable with it because the, the choice is ambiguous. I mean, it's you're going to be is it are you choosing mechanics or are you choosing statistical mechanics? Are you choosing wave or choosing particle? And there's no way to decide that. So it's kind of this, it looks like to them, there's like, oh, the choice, if it's, it's just, it's random, it's arbitrary. Well, it's not really arbitrary, it just doesn't make sense in either of the mechanics and they're just stuck. Okay, what I'm gonna say is that what makes that choice is it takes work. Okay, so one of my friend, uh, David Feinstein, and I talk about this. So in order to collapse the wave function, you need, you need to do something thermodynamic. Okay, and I'm gonna say that is what, Carnot's about. So Carnot's thing is telling us, how, is giving us the answer to how thermodynamic, how uh, quantum theory actually works and kind of makes sense. So you can make, if you want to know what quantum reality is really about, it's really about this world of engines and workers and everything, all the way down to atoms and protons and neutrons and everything. Uh, okay, last couple things. So, so motion and action. So what is, what is work in Carnot? It's engineering work. It's doing things, okay? So all these workers are doing things. And that's part of the thing. When they do something, they have this loss. They can't capture the loss to support the doing. Okay, that's one of the characteristics of doing something, okay? So, uh, but, so, and as you look at my other lectures last couple of years, engineering's attempt to move from a current state of affairs to a future more desirable state of affairs. That's what engineers do. They, yeah, they problem solve. They problem solve moving from a current state of affairs to a future more desirable state of affairs. So. If all these workers, what are all they're doing? They're trying to move to, they're working together, trying to work together. That's what they're all doing to move universe forward. So Dewey, a pragmatist guy, says what's going on is we're all involved in the construction of the good. Uh, so this is, I have to tell through this meaningful thing, okay? So the construction of the good, so the meaning and value. So what engineers are doing, trying to bring more, they're trying to make the universe better. They're trying to bring in more value into the world. So if you try and think about meaning and value, what makes life meaningful is to do things that are valuable. Okay, this is valuable. So it really matters what you do and how you do it and, and that, to bring value into the world. So a meaningful life is one that works to bring about more desirable future. So and Carnot's epiphany is that we're all engineers. We're all doing that and boom. So that's, all right, that's it. I can't say any more. <laughs>